Good evening, and welcome to ABN's Jihad Watch program. I am Robert Spencer, and today's topic is the Quran. Where did it come from? Now, of course, the pious Muslim answer to that question is that the sole author of the Quran is Allah himself, who delivered the book piecemeal, but in perfect form, through the angel Gabriel to Muhammad. It says in the Quran itself, it is we, that is Allah, who always speaks of himself in the royal we in the Quran. It is we who have sent down the Quran to you by stages. Allah taunts the unbelievers with this fact. It says, it is surely a noble Quran in a hidden book. None but the purified shall touch, ascending down from the Lord of all being. What, do you hold this discourse in disdain? And do you make it your living to cry lies? That's chapter 56, verses 77 to 82. Those who do not accept the claim that God is the author of the Quran generally assume that it was Muhammad who is the author of the Quran. Uh, certainly the book gives an immediate impression of originating from a single author, what with its repetitions, its stylistic ticks, such as ending verses with taglines, such as Allah is mighty and wise, which appears with slight variations 40 times in the Quran, and its overall unity of message, despite numerous contradictions on particulars. For many people, both Muslim and non-Muslim, the Quran itself is the principal indication that the canonical story of Islam's origins is essentially true. That is, that Muhammad was a uh, merchant who was praying uh, outside Mecca and received this uh, visitation from the angel Gabriel, and that that became the Quran as he continued to receive these revelations. Uh, generally, the uh, the controversy has been in history as to whether these were genuine revelations from God or whether Muhammad himself was fabricating them. But when one looks at Islamic tradition, there's considerably more to the story and considerably more questions are raised. Of course, for Muslims, the Quran is a perfect copy of the perfect eternal book, the mother of the book, that has existed forever with Allah in paradise. The Quran testifies this of itself. By the clear book, behold, we have made it an Arabic Quran. Haply you will understand, and behold, it is in the essence of the book with us, the mother of the book with us, sublime indeed and wise. The Quran contains, it tells us of itself, quite simply, the truth. These are the signs of the book, the ayats or verses of the Quran, or as the word is signs. These are the signs of the book, and that which has been sent down to you from your Lord is the truth but most men do not believe. Muslims throughout history have, of course, regarded the Quran as the unquestioned and unquestionable word of Allah, the supreme guide to human behavior, the inexhaustible fount of knowledge, wisdom, and insight into the inner workings of this world as well as the next. What's more, Muslims believe that the text of the Quran as it stands today is the same as it was when the Caliph Uthman compiled and published the standard canonical text in the year 653, nothing, they claim, has been changed, nothing has been added, nothing has been lost. The text of the Quran is entirely reliable, says the modern-day Turkish Muslim pol political and educational leader, Fethullah Gulen. Gulen says, it has been as it is, unaltered, unedited, not tampered with in any way since the time of its revelation. This view has been standard in the Islamic world since at least the 10th century. <clears throat> the Mutazilites, a sect of Islam at around that time, around the 10th century, who were al alone among the Muslims to believe that the Quran was a human creation, not a perfect copy of an eternal and divine book. But by that time, that's around the 10th century, this idea was generally regarded as a heresy. And the Mutazilites, facing persecution, eventually died out, along with the idea that the text of the Quran was ever subject in any way to human vagaries. <clears throat> and so, the 19th century non-Muslim historian William Muir asserted that, <coughs> excuse me, that the Quranic text had been preserved so carefully that there were no variations of importance. We might almost say no variations at all to be found in the innumerable copies scattered throughout the vast bounds of the empire of Islam. The 20th century Quran commentator and politician Sayyid Abu Allah Maududi said that the Quran exists exactly as it had been revealed to the Prophet. Not a word, nay, not a dot of it has been changed. 
It is available in its original text, and the word of God has now been preserved for all times to come. This claim is a commonplace of Muslim apologetic literature. Yet today's Qur'ans are based on a text that can be traced back to medieval Islamic tradition, but no further. The standard text published in Cairo in 1924 is based on Islamic traditions about the text of the Qur'an that date at their earliest from more than a century after Muhammad is supposed to have lived. The lack of variation to, the, to which Gulen and so many other Islamic spokesmen refer reflects the fact that most Qur'ans today depend on the same medieval sources, not on anything close to the original 7th century manuscript. And even that consistency breaks down on closer inspection. So too does the claim that the Qur'anic text has never been changed since the various surahs were delivered to Muhammad through the angel Gabriel. Even Islamic tradition shows this contention to be highly questionable, with indications that some of the Qur'an was lost and other parts were added to or otherwise changed. There is little dispute, however, about the Islamic account that the Qur'an originated with Muhammad. For most people who consider the question at all, what is at issue is whether Muhammad was really reciting revelations from Allah or passing off warmed-over biblical stories and other material as the divine voice. But an examination of the records, including early Islamic tradition itself, indicates that the canonical text of the Qur'an cannot be attributed to Muhammad in any way, shape, or form. Even the canonical Islamic accounts of how Muhammad received revelations suggest a less than heavenly origin to many Quran verses. The hadiths concerning the circumstances of Quranic revelations sometimes betray a certain improvisational quality. Since, as we've, since the stories are almost certainly not historical accounts, the question has to be raised as to why they may have been invented. The, question to, the answer to this lies in the evolving nature of Islamic tradition itself. These stories were developed as the particular characteristics of Islam came to the fore. Islam began to take shape as a religion different from and indeed opposed to Judaism and Christianity with this central figure, Muhammad, and tales of his exploits began to be circulated among the subjects of the new Arab empire in the 8th century, 9th century. But if the founding figure of the new religion was to have received a perfect new scripture from the supreme God, then it is very odd, but it is nonetheless true, that the stories of its delivery emphasize its quite less than flawless transmission. Now, if Islam and the Quran actually evolved during the 8th and 9th centuries, rather than being delivered to Muhammad and being complete by the time of Muhammad's death, as a considerable amount of historical evidence suggests, then the ongoing changes in the Islamic doctrine and in Islamic practice had to be explained somehow. And so hadiths would need to be invented that would convince the faithful that these changes dated from the time of Muhammad. And this is why there is variation and doctrinal differences within the Quran itself. The best way to explain and justify this considerable theological flux would be to make revision and even forgetfulness and loss of portions of the Quran part of the story of how the divine revelation was collected. And that's exactly what we see in the Hadiths. One Hadith, for example, relates how Muhammad revised a revelation that he just received from Allah because of a question that a blind man posed to him. The revelation concerned the value of fighting jihad. Such believers sit at home who, s at, such believers who sit at home are not the equals of those who struggle in the path of God, that is, mujahideen fi sabil Allah, with their possessions and their and themselves and their selves. <clears throat> now that's the original revelation that Muhammad supposedly received. But according to this hadith, Muhammad called for one of his scribes, Zayd ibn Tabit, so that he could dictate this revelation. But when Muhammad began to dictate, a blind man who was present, Amr bin Umm Maktum, interrupted him and called out, O oh Allah's apostle, what is your order for me, as I'm a blind man? Now, what he was asking was, would he be considered a lesser Muslim for being unable to participate in jihad warfare because of his disability, since the revelation said that the believers who sit at home are not the equals of those who participate in jihad for the sake of Allah. So hearing this question, Muhammad dictated the new revelation with a caveat. 
such believers as sit at home unless they have an injury are not the equals of those who struggle in the path of Allah with their possessions and their selves. That's Quran chapter 4 verse 95. But the question is, that piece about unless they have an injury, did Allah suddenly revise the revelation he'd just given to Muhammad or did Muhammad interpolate it on his own authority and it's not entirely the word of Allah. But what's noteworthy is, is that this is in a canonical hadith, this is in Islamic tradition that the text of the Quran was changed by Muhammad in this way. And so this haphazardness is an indication that there was revision, there was change in Islamic doctrine, because there, be cons there are considerably more examples, as I will get to in a moment. But the haphazardness is testimony to the idea that the Quran and Islam did not emerge finished from the mind of Muhammad, whether he is the one who originated it or whether it came from Allah, but that it was the product of considerable evolution and development. Another hadith relates how Muhammad was traveling with Umar, who later became the caliph, the successor of Muhammad, as the leader of the Muslims, when Umar asked him a question. But Muhammad didn't answer. Umar repeated his question twice, but still Muhammad didn't answer. And so Umar started to get worried. And he said, I feared that a piece of Quran was being sent down about me. It was not long before I heard a crier calling for me, and I said that I feared that a piece of Quran had been sent down about me. Now, a portion of the Quran, chapter 48, did indeed come to Muhammad, according to this hadith, but Umar was not rebuked or mentioned in it. Still, Umar clearly had the idea that Quranic revelation, that is, the release, the revelation of the perfect and eternal book that had existed forever with Allah in paradise, could be altered by his question or by his behavior. This would indicate either that Umar had a place in Allah's eternal plan for the Quranic revelation, or that it was not perfect and eternal at all, but could be altered as circumstances warranted. And that may have been the purpose that this hadith served, to explain the variance that such alterations created. Another trace of the alterations to the Quran comes from the 13th century Muslim historian Ibn al-Athir. He stated that one of Muhammad's secretaries, Abdullah ibn, Sa'ad, uh, ibn Abi Sar, used to record the revelation for the Prophet in Medina, but then left Islam and returned to Mecca where he noted that Muhammad was remarkably cavalier about the revelations he received. The scribe says, I used to orient Muhammad whenever I willed. He dictated to me all powerful, all wise, and I suggested all knowing, all wise. So he would say, yes, it's all the same. The ninth century Muslim historian, Al-Waqidi, records that Abdullah ibn Sa'd said to the Meccans, it was only a Christian slave who was teaching him, that is, Muhammad, I used to write to him and change whatever I wanted. In line with this, another 13th century Islamic scholar, Abdullah al-Baidawi, recorded in a hadith that Abdullah ibn Sa'd used to mock Muhammad's claim to have received revelations. To me, it has been revealed when naught has been revealed to him. This secretary to the Prophet repudiated Islam and he, after he became convinced that divine intervention was not responsible for the Quran. Muhammad was once dictating the Quran, uh, in particular chapter 23, verse 14, to Abdullah, going like this. We created man of an, of an extraction of clay, then we set him a drop in a receptacle secure, then we created of the drop a clot, then we created of the clot a tissue, then we created of the tissue bones, then we garmented the bones in flesh, thereafter we produced him as another creature. Hearing this, Abdullah exclaimed, So blessed be God, the fairest of creators. Muhammad responded, Write it down, for thus it has been revealed. Which is to say, Abdullah's exclamation became part of the Quranic revelation. This, not surprisingly, disillusioned Abdullah. He said, If Muhammad is truthful, then I receive the revelation as much as he does. And if he's a liar, what I said is as good as what he said. Muslim scholars, of course, describe Abdullah as a disgruntled former employee, fabricating stories about his former boss that he'd come to dislike. But if the entire scenario of Muhammad's receiving and dictating revelations was an ahistorical invention of the later Muslim community, such stories may have helped to explain why variants existed in the Quran and Hadith. And all this testifies here again that to the idea that Islam was a product of long historical development and not something 
that was essentially codified and solidified by the year 653 when Uthman is supposed to have distributed the Quran to the provinces. Hadiths may have been composed at a time when some people in the community remembered earlier formulations that had been discarded. If, however, the revered prophet of Islam himself could be shown as having freely altered the revelations he had received from Allah, then clearly alterations to the texts and teachings of the religion could not be condemned outright, and this evolution of Islam could go on unhindered and unchallenged. In line with the apparent necessity to justify variability and change within Islamic tradition, many hadiths record that even Muhammad himself forgot parts of what Allah had revealed to him. One recounts that Allah's messenger heard a man reciting the Quran at night and said, May Allah bestow his mercy on him as he has reminded me of such and such verses of such and such surah which I was caused to forget. Now, as might be expected in confessional literature, this is represented as being all part of Allah's plan. The Hadith has Muhammad himself say, It is a bad thing that some of you say, I have forgotten such and such verse of the Quran. For indeed, he has been caused by Allah to forget it. So you must keep on reciting the Quran, because it escapes from the hearts of men faster than camels do when they are released from their tying ropes. Even in the Quran itself, Allah tells his prophet, We shall make thee recite to forget not save what God wills. Surely he knows what is spoken aloud and what is hidden. Thus, if Muhammad has forgotten part of what Allah revealed, it's no cause for concern. The Quran also says, None of our revelations do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, but we substitute something better or similar. Do you not know that Allah has power over all things? That's chapter 2, verse 106, and of course becomes the basis for the Islamic doctrine of abrogation that there are pieces of the Quran that are superseded by other messages in the same book. Allah even complains that this process makes some people doubt the veracity of his prophet. And when we exchange a verse in the place of another verse, and Allah knows very well what he is sending down, they say, you are a mere forger. No, but the most of them have no knowledge. If religious authorities in the Umayyad and Abbasid caliphates were busy substituting one revelation for another in order to suit their new policies and practices, such a statement from Allah himself would be exceedingly useful. Elsewhere, the Quran seems to address concerns about varying versions of its contents and say, I am surely a manifest warner, so we sent it down to the partitioners who have broken the Quran into fragments. It's chapter 15, verses 89 to 91. Some hadiths record that Muhammad himself was unconcerned with variations that early on began to appear in how Muslims were reciting his revelations, implying that if Muhammad didn't worry about such variations, then why should any of his followers? Ubay ibn Ka'ab, whom a hadith had Muhammad praising as the best reader of the Quran among my people, is made to recall his shock at Muhammad's lack of concern about these variations. The strange incident began, according to the hadith, when Ubay heard variant readings of the Quran recited in the mosque. <clears throat> he says, I was in the mosque when a man entered and prayed and recited the Quran in a style to which I objected. Then another man entered the mosque and recited in a style different from that of his companion. Ubay decided to appeal to Muhammad himself. When we had finished the prayer, we all went to Allah's messenger and said to him, This man recited in a style to which I objected and the other entered and recited in a style different from that of his companion. But according to the Hadith, Muhammad expressed approval of their affairs, that is, of their way of reciting the Quran. Now this very much troubled Ubay, and he recalled, and there occurred in my mind a sort of denial, <coughs> which did not occur even in during the days of ignorance, that is, the days before the revelation of the Quran began. This reaction annoyed Muhammad in turn. When the messenger of Allah saw how I was affected by a wrong idea, he struck my chest, whereupon I broke into sweating and felt as though I were looking at Allah with fear. Muhammad explained that the variants, which he represented simply as differences in the Arabic dialect used for, the, for uh, recitation, were all parts of Allah's plan. And Muhammad said to Ubay, Ubay, a message was sent to me to recite the Quran in one dialect, and I replied, make things easy for my people. It was conveyed to me for the second time 
that it should be recited in two dialects. I again replied to him, make affairs easy for my people. It was again conveyed to me for the third time to recite in seven dialects. If variants and changes ex if existed and had to be explained, this was as good an attempt to do so as any. In another hadith, Umar is made to recall, I heard Hisham ibn Hakim reciting Surat al-Furqan, that's the chapter, the 25th chapter of the Quran, <clears throat> during the lifetime of Allah's messenger. And I listened to his revelation, recitation and noticed that he recited in several different ways, which Allah's messenger had not taught me. Umar was angry about this, and he was so incensed about it, he says, I was about to jump over him, that is Hisham, during his salat, his prayer, but I controlled my temper, and when he had completed his salat, I put my upper garment around his neck and seized him by it and said, Who taught you this surah which I heard you reciting? Hisham's response was as surprising to Umar as Muhammad's casual reaction to the variants had been to Ubay. He replied, Allah's messenger taught it to me. Umar then said to him, You've been told a lie, for Allah's messenger has taught it to me in a different way from yours. So I dragged him to Allah's messenger, and I said, I heard this person reciting Surat al-Furqan in a way which you haven't taught me. Muhammad, according to the Hadith, backed up Hisham, com commanding Umar, Release him! Recite, O Hisham! The Prophet explained, It was revealed in this way, after Hisham recited. Then he turned to Umar and told him to recite. And Umar recited his version of the chapter, and then Muhammad said, It was revealed in this way. The Quran has been revealed to be recited in seven different ways. So recite of it whichever way is easier for you, or read as much of it as may be easy for you. <clears throat> on another occasion, Muhammad is made to elaborate on this odd explanation for the variants. He says that Gabriel recited the Quran to me in one way. Then I requested him to read it in another way and continued asking him to recite it in other ways, and he recited it in several ways, till he ultimately recited it in seven different ways. Yet, if the canonical Islamic stories of Muhammad's life are accurate, Muhammad recited the Quran in only one way. What's more, it's unlikely that Ubay and Umar would have been depicted as becoming so enraged over these variants if the only difference were really just a matter of dialect, that is, a shift in the pronunciation of the words. How could variants have arisen if Muhammad received revelations from Allah in perfect fashion, which would apparently involve his total recall of what Gabriel had delivered to him. Did the perfect book exist in variant readings? Did Allah have seven different copies of the mother of the book that all, were variated, var all had variations from one another? And if not, then how did the perfect earthly copy of that eternal book, the Quran, come to have these kinds of variants? Now, Islamic tradition itself also implies that the Quran was altered after it first appeared among the believers. According to the Hadith, during Muhammad's lifetime, his companions would memorize various portions of the Quran. Some had the portions committed to memory, others had others. Some had some portions committed to memory. Some had some of it, but not all of it, was written down. But not long after Muhammad died, according to these traditions, some of the people who had memorized portions of the Quran were killed in the Battle of Yamama. Parts of the Quran died with them, according to the Hadith. Many of the passages of the Quran, says a Hadith, that were sent down were known by those who died on the day of Yamama, but they were not known by those who survived them, nor were they written down, nor had the first three caliphs, Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman, by that time collected the Quran, nor were they found with even one person after them. No contemporary historical evidence establishes that there ever was a battle of Yamama or that anyone who had memorized portions of the Quran died there. No mention of the Quran, in fact, at, is made at all anywhere by anyone until nearly a century after the death of Muhammad and after the battle of Yamama is supposed to have, take, supposed to have taken place. <clears throat> so the traditions regarding the battle of Yamama and the collection of the Quran that followed from it probably emerged in a context in which the holy book was undergoing editing and alteration, such that variant formulations and differences in content had to be explained. Early Islamic sources repeatedly attest to the loss of sections of the Quran. One hadith has an elderly Muslim reciting a passage from Surah 98 that said, 
The religion with Allah is al hanifiya that is, the upright way, rather than that of the Jews or the Christians. And those who do good will not go unrewarded. But it was gone. There is no such passage in Surah 98. Likewise vanished, according to another hadith, was the section that mandated the stoning of adulterers. The Caliph Umar declared, I am afraid that after a long time has passed, people will say, we do not find the verses of the Rajam, stoning to death, in the holy book. And consequently, they may go astray by leaving an obligation that Allah has revealed. Lo, I confirm that the penalty of Rajam be inflicted on him who commits illegal sexual intercourse if he is already married and the crime is proved by witnesses or pregnancy or confession. Surely Allah's apostle carried out the penalty of Rajam and so we did after him. <coughs> Surah 33 of the Quran, according to another hadith, was originally 127 verses longer than it is in the canonical text. In this hadith, Muhammad's wife Aisha is made to say, Surat al-Azab, that is Surah 33, used to be recited in the time of the Prophet with 200 verses. But when Uthman wrote out the codices, he was unable to procure more of it than what there is today. Aisha asserted that this was the chapter that originally included the verse about stoning. She said, the fornicators among the married men and married women stone them as exemplary punishment from Allah, and Allah is mighty and wise. Still another hadith records an occasion on which a venerable Muslim in the city of Basra reminisced about a lost surah of the Quran. We used to recite a surah, he said, which resembled in length and severity to surah Basra. Barat, surah Barat, surah al bara more commonly known as surat At-Tawbah, or repentance, is the Quran's ninth surah, and it contains the book's fiercest exhortations to jihad warfare. That is, uh, slay the unbelievers wherever you find them, in chapter 9, verse 5, and the uh, command to wage jihad warfare against the Jews and the Christians, which is in chapter 9, verse 29. But the old man could recall little of what the lost surah contains. He said, I have, however, forgotten it, with the exception of this which I remember out of it, if there were two valleys full of riches <coughs> for the son of Adam, he would long for a third valley, and nothing would fill the stomach of the son of Adam but dust. He also said, we used to recite a surah similar to one of the Musabihat, but that's uh, uh, other, other chapters of the Quran that do exist in the, book, in the book, but he said, and I no longer remember it, but this much I have indeed preserved. O you who truly believe, why do you preach that which you do not practice? And that is inscribed on your necks as a witness that you will be examined about it on the day of resurrection. Now, significantly, the only two verses that the man, the man had, could recall of this surah that was lost are actually in the Quran elsewhere. And so it's possible that they were added into the Quranic text after these hadiths appeared that claimed their divine origin. Other hadiths have the Caliph Abu Bakr seeing the loss of sections of the Quran as a looming crisis that threatened the still nascent Muslim community, ordering, ordering one of Muhammad's secretaries to collect the various, various portions of the Quran to keep it from being lost. The scribe he summoned was Zayd ibn Tabit, who was the same one featured in the story of Muhammad and the blind man who led to the interpolation of a piece of the Quran. The uh, Hadith has Zayd explained the way he recorded Muhammad's revelations and helped him communicate also with the local Jewish leaders. It said, he says, the messenger of Allah ordered me to study for him the script of the Jews, or Kitab al-Yahud, which can be translated the book of the Jews. And he said to me, I do not trust the Jews with regard to my correspondence. Not even half a month passed until I used to write for him. And they wrote to him, and I would read their letter. Zayd was chosen to collect the Quran, this Hadith explained, because he had already memorized the entire book. But there are numerous questions about that as well. And we will continue this discussion of the mysterious and murky origins of the Quran after these messages. I'm Robert Spencer with ABN's Jihad Watch program, and we'll be right back after this. Hello, this is Sam Shamoon from the Jesus or Muhammad show one half of the team with David Wood. I'm here exhorting my brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ who've been blessed by the programs at ABN 
especially by the Jesus or Muhammad show, to consider and prayerfully consider to partner with us financially because as you know, ABN is a viewer supported satellite station. In order for us to continue to broadcast the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, not just to Christians, but also to Muslims, and not just to Muslims, but to those who are sitting on the fence and are considering embracing a, a worldview or seeking after God, ABN wants to reach these people, but can only do so with your financial support. So I'm encouraging my brothers and sisters to come alongside ABN and make a financial contribution to continue Jesus and Muhammad and other shows with the purpose of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, seeing Christians get strengthened in their faith, Muslims coming to saving faith in Jesus, and others turning to Christ as their only hope and Savior. But again, we cannot do this if the support does not come in to continue to broadcast these shows. So would you please consider prayerfully asking God whether He'd have you support us on a regular basis so that we continue these programs and continue to bless the people of God, preach the truth of the gospel to the non-Christians, including Muslims, so that in everything we say and do that Jesus Christ will be glorified and that His gospel will spread throughout the entire world. Would you please join us financially? Thank you so much. We're back. This is ABN's Jihad Watch program. I'm Robert Spencer, and we are discussing tonight the mysterious origins of the Quran, which, of course, Muslims contend is a perfect copy of the perfect and eternal book that existed forever with Allah in paradise and then was delivered over a period of 23 years in perfect and pristine fashion through the angel Gabriel to the prophet Muhammad and was then miraculously preserved from all variance and all corruption from that day until our own. There are numerous problems with this story. We've been exploring how Islamic tradition itself testifies to the fact that there was considerable loss, revision, and alteration in the collection of the Quran and even in its revelation to Muhammad. And that these stories about the, uh, the slippage and the loss and the variations in the Quran that were uh, told by Muslims themselves appear to be attempting to explain changes in Islamic doctrine and practice and that that itself testifies to the fact that Islam developed over a period of time in the 8th and ninth centuries and did not emerge uh, whole from uh, Muhammad 
uh, and was complete by his death in the year 632, or at very least by the time uh, that the Uthman is supposed to have collected together the Quran, burned all the variants, and distributed the product to the provinces in the year 653. Even the story of how that came about shows considerable variation in the Quranic text and alteration in it. Zayd ibn Tabit, as we were discussing this before the break, was chosen to collect the Quran, and he was chosen to do so because he had memorized the entire book already. Now, of course, this immediately doesn't make any sense because if Zayd had really memorized the entire Quran, then Abu Bakr would not have needed him to track down various people who had memorized various portions of it and collect what he found. Zayd could have just sat down and written it all out himself. But instead, he's ordered to go and speak to various people who had memorized various parts of the book and get what they had. So did he have the whole Quran memorized or didn't he? Or was it that the Quran that he supposedly had memorized was not the same as the Quran that he would receive portions of from other people? Whatever the case, the Hadith recounts that Zayd actually refused the Caliph's request because Muhammad himself had never tried to collect the Quran together. So why should they try to do something that Muhammad himself did not try to do? In response, Abu Bakr and Umar, who of course would ultimately succeed Abu Bakr as the Caliph, insisted that collecting the Quran was a matter of necessity and thus advancing a justification for this religious innovation under the guise of traditionalism. Zayd reluctantly agreed to undertake the project, but he said, by Allah, if they had ordered me to shift one of the mountains, it would not have been heavier for me than this ordering me to collect the Quran. <coughs> Nonetheless, a hadith recounts that he went to work and he did the work conscientiously. He says, I started locating Quranic material and collecting it from parchments, scapula, leaf stalks of date palms, and from the memories of men who knew it by heart. I found with Kuzema two verses of Surah at Tauba, which I had not found with anybody else. Kuzema was an early Muslim who accosted Zayd when he heard his version of Surah 9 recited and informed him, I see you've overlooked two verses and have not written them. So Zayd added them in. So apparently if Kuzema hadn't been present when Zayd was reciting or having recited what he had of chapter 9, then those two verses, which come at the very end of chapter 9, verses 128 and 129, presumably would have been lost and not included in the Quran. That loss would have been insignificant to Islamic doctrine and practice, but it does bear witness to how the Hadith explain and obliquely justify what must have been evident to many 9th century believers, that their religion and even their holy book were undergoing extensive changes. The process of collecting the Quran was random and disorganized enough for one Muslim to warn in a Hadith, let none of you say I have acquired the whole of the Quran. How does he know what all of it is when much of the Quran has disappeared? Rather let him say, I have acquired what has survived. I have acquired what has survived. This hardly conforms with confident pronouncements that the Quran has been as it is, unaltered, unedited, not tampered with in any way since the time of its revelation, as Fathula Gulen claimed. Even Aisha, Muhammad's favorite wife, known by the honorific Mother of the Believers, is made to testify indirectly to the haphazard quality of the Quran's collection. She recalled that amongst what was sent down of the Quran was ten known sucklings make haram. Then it was abrogated by five known sucklings. When the Messenger of Allah, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, died, it was what is now recited of the Quran. In another version, while discussing fosterage, which makes marriage unlawful, Aisha said, there was revealed in the Quran ten clear sucklings and then five clear sucklings. Now here Aisha is referring to a very strange Islamic doctrine, one that became controversial when it was reiterated by an Egyptian sheikh a few years ago. She's referring to the idea that an unmarried male and an unmarried female, or a male and female who are not married to each other, may lawfully be alone together, for example, in a workplace environment, only if she becomes his foster mother. And she becomes his foster mother by actually suckling, by nursing him at the breast for a specified number of times. So what Aisha is saying in these hadiths is that the Quran originally said that a woman becomes the foster mother of a man by nursing him ten times, 
and then it was changed to five times, and then it was removed from the Quran altogether. Another hadith has Aisha ordering one of her servants, Yunus, to write out a copy of the Quran. She instructed him, when you reach this ayat, here again, sign, of the Quran, let me know. Guard the prayers carefully and the middle prayer and stand obedient to Allah. That's Quran chapter 2, verse 238. And so when Yunus reached that point, Aisha dictated an amended version of the verse to him. Guard the prayers carefully and the middle prayer and the Asr prayer, that is the afternoon prayer, and stand obedient to Allah. Aisha explained, I heard it from the messenger of Allah. Islamic tradition does not provide the only evidence that changes were made to the wording of the eternal book of Allah. Although manuscript evidence is scarce, on close scrutiny, the text of the Quran offers telling indications that it has been altered. This evidence makes it extraordinarily unlikely that the text was the product of one man, whether the historical person of Muhammad or someone else. Rather, it indicates that the text has undergone extensive revisions, consistent with the likelihood that it was developed over time by a series of people. For example, the pioneering Quranic scholar Richard Bell, who died in 1952, closely examined the Quranic text and identified numerous signs that the text had been changed. Lack of continuity, inherent contradictions are two of the most common indications. For example, take one curious passage that Bell highlighted. It's a polemic against the Jews and the Christians, and it comes in chapter 2, verses 116 to 121. And in the... Uh, text as it stands, it goes like this. And they say, Allah has taken to him a son. Glory be to him. Nay, to him belongs all that is in the heavens and in the earth. All obey his will. The creator of the heavens and the earth. And when he decrees a thing, he but says to it, be, and it is. And they that know not say, why does Allah not speak to us? Why does a sign not come to us? So spoke those before them, as these men say. Their hearts are much alike. Yet we have made clear the signs unto a people that are sure. We have sent you with the truth, good tidings to bear, and warning. You shall not be questioned touching the inhabitants of hell. Never will the Jews be satisfied with you, neither the Christians, not till you follow their religion. Say, Allah's guidance is the true guidance. If you follow their caprices after the knowledge that has come to you, you shall have against God neither helper nor protector. Those to whom we have given the book and who recite it with true recitation they believe in it, and whoever disbelieves in it, they shall be the losers. Now, Richard Bell points out that all the polemical insertions in, assertions, that is, in the beginning of the passage that I just read, that is, and they say, Allah has taken to him a son, glory be to him, the creator of the heavens and earth, when he says to something, be, it is, that they all actually answer the claim that comes later down in the passage, that the passage later says, Never will the Jews be satisfied with you, neither the Christians, till you follow their religion. Say, Allah's guidance is the true guidance. So, in other words, the Jews and the Christians will never be satisfied with the Muslim believers until they convert to their religions. He is, Bell suggests that these verses were inserted later and were originally intended to follow verse 121. And that the material in the middle about why they, the people, the unbelievers, come and say, why isn't Allah spoken to us and so on, that that was about, that's some other argument against some people who are demanding miracles of the Muslim prophet, only, whose only miracle, according to the Quran, is the Quran itself. And so, as presented in the passage as it now stands, that interrupts the argument. But uh, Bell suggests that if you rearrange it a little bit, it makes a whole lot more sense. So that if it goes like this, never will the Jews be satisfied with you, neither the Christians, nor not till you follow their religions. Say, Allah's guidance is the true guidance. If you follow their caprices after the knowledge that has come to you, you shall have against Allah neither protector nor helper. And, they say, Allah has taken to him a son. Glory be to him, nay, to him belongs all that is in the heavens and in the earth. All obey his will, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And when he decrees a thing, he says to it, be, and it is. Those to whom we have given the book and who recite it with true recitation they believe in it, and whoever disbelieves in it, they shall be the losers. Now, there's no manuscript evidence for this kind of thing, but there's no doubt that Bell's reconstruction, as conjectural as it is, makes a whole lot more sense and has a great deal more logical flow 
than the Quran as it stands now. The Quran as it stands now uh, moves from subject to subject, often without any kind of narrative continuity and without any warning or without any kind of coherent flow. One explanation for this may be that it was indeed a collection of various fragments that were put together and sometimes not put together very artfully such that interpolations were made that interrupt the logical flow of the passages. And that's what Bell is saying, that these things may, not indica may indicate that the Quran itself does not have a uh, narrative context or continuity and that this is an indication that it is a collection of writings from various hands. There is also something else very telling about this perfect and eternal book, and that is that there is a great deal in it that is not Arabic, not pure and clear Arabic as it self-claims. The 20th century translator of the Quran, Muhammad Marmaduke Pickthall, who was an English convert to Islam, once declared that the Quran in Arabic was, quote, an inimitable symphony, the very sounds of which move men to tears and ecstasy. Pickthall, of course, would not have dared to claim the same thing about any translation of the Muslim holy book, including his own English translation. For Muslims, the Arabic of the Quran is essential to the Quran itself, such that in any other language, the book may contain the meaning of the Quran, but is no longer truly the Quran itself. This belief stems from the Quran, which insists on its Arabic character so often that Islamic theologians have quite understandably understood Arabic to be part of the Quran's very essence. The Quran says that it is written in Arabic, pure and clear. It is an Arabic judgment. It is the revelation of the Lord of all being that was brought down by the faithful spirit upon your heart that you may be one of the warners in a clear Arabic tongue. Allah says that he has sent it down as an Arabic Quran in order that you may learn wisdom. It is a Quran in Arabic that you may be able to understand. The Quran is not only a guide to understanding, but is also intended for those Arabic speakers who already grasp its message. It is a book whose signs have been distinguished as an Arabic Quran for people having knowledge. Allah even explains that if he had sent down the Quran in any other language, people would then complain. Had we sent this as a Quran in a language other than Arabic, they would have said, why are not its verses explained in detail? What, not in Arabic and its messenger is an Arab? It is quite simply an Arabic Quran, something that Quran, the Quran says of itself in six different places, five different places. Islamic tradition reinforces this point. In one hadith, an early Muslim, Al Hassan, recounts of an er another early Muslim. I heard Abu Ab Ubaidah say that whoever pretends that there is in the Quran anything other than the Arabic tongue has made a serious charge against Allah. And he quoted a verse Verily, we have made it an Arabic Quran. Ibn Kathir, the renowned Quranic commentator, elaborated on this orthodox view, saying the Arabic language is the most eloquent, plain, deep, and expressive of the meanings that might arise in one's mind. Therefore, the most honorable book was revealed in the most honorable language to the most honorable prophet and messenger, delivered by the most honorable angel in the most honorable land on earth. And its revelation started during the most honorable month of the year, Ramadan. Therefore, the Quran is perfect in every respect. There's only one problem with the widespread assertion that the Quran was written in Arabic. It's not true. Even the most cursory examination of the evidence indicates that the most honorable book in its original form was not actually in the most honorable language at all. The very fact that the Quran asserts so many times that it was handed down in Arabic gives, raises questions. Why would a clear and easily understandable book need to assert more than once that it was clear and easy to understand? Why would an Arabic book need to insist again and again that it was in Arabic? The various authors of the Greek New Testament never feel the need to assert the fact that they're writing in Greek. They just do it. This is a point that they take for granted. Of course, the New Testament doesn't make the claims about Greek that the Quran makes about Arabic. Greek in Christianity is not the language of God. It has no more significance than any other language. But that in itself is part of the mystery of the Quranic claims. Why did they need to be made at all? Why was there so much anxiety about the Arabic chapter character of the Quran that it had to be repeated and insisted upon so many times? 
This peculiar insistence on the Arabic character of the Quran even became part of Islamic theology, which affirms that Arabic is the language of Allah and that the God who created every human being and presumably understands every human tongue will not accept prayers or recitations of his holy book in any other language. When the Quran repeatedly insists that it was written in Arabic, it was not, it's not unreasonable to conclude that someone somewhere was saying that it wasn't in Arabic at all. A point needs emphasis only when it's controverted. As the 19th century man of letters John Henry Newman wrote in a vastly different context, no doctrine is defined until it's violated. In other words, the assertion of a religious doctrine in an environment involving a competition of religious ideas doesn't generally take place except as a response to the contrary proposition. The Quran thus insists so repeatedly on its Arabic essence because that was precisely the issue that others were challenging. The Quran is highly polemical in nature. It answers the theological claims of Judaism and Christianity and responds to the arguments of the unbelievers and hypocrites against Muhammad's prophetic claims and its own divine origins. On practically every page, there is a denunciation of the unbelievers. Many of these contain reports of what those unbelievers are saying against Muhammad and Islam and explanations of why their charges are false. It would not be unusual if it also took on challenges to its Arabic origins. The Quran itself tells us of challenges to claims of the book's Arabic origins. According to the Quran, Muhammad's detractors charged the prophet of Islam with getting material from non-Arabic sources and then passing it off as what he received as divine revelation. The Quran responds furiously to those who deride Muhammad for listening intently, perhaps to the Jewish and Christian teachers whose teachings ended up as part of rev uh, Quranic revelation. And some of them hurt the prophet, saying, he is all ear. Allah tells Muhammad how to respond to those who make fun of him in this way. Say, an ear is good for you. He believes in Allah and believes the believers, and he is a mercy to the believers among you. Those who heard Allah's messenger for them awaits a painful chastisement. Muhammad's foes apparently charged him with getting material from a non-Arabic speaker as well. We know indeed that they say, it is a man who teaches him. While yet the tongue of him they wickedly point to is notably foreign, while this is Arabic, pure and clear. It's chapter 16, verse 103. This mysterious foreigner has often been identified with one of Muhammad's early companions, Salman the Persian. The Arabic word translated as foreign in this Quranic verse is ajami, which means Persian or Iranian, and is more generalized as foreigner. Ibn Ishaq identifies the foreigner as Quran 16 verse 103 as Jabr the Christian, slave of Ibn al-Hadrami and teacher of Muhammad. Another ajami identified in Islamic tradition is Abu Fuqayha Yasar, the Quranic scholar Mukatil ibn Sulaiman of the 8th century, says that Yasar was a Jew, not an Arab, who spoke Greek. The modern-day Islamic scholar, Claude Guillot, observes that it is more likely that he spoke Aramaic, of which Syriac is a dialect. Mukatil also recounts accusations from Muhammad's opponent, An nasr ibn al-Harith, that mention both Jabir and Yasser, saying, This Quran is not but lies that Muhammad himself has forged. Those who help him are Adas, a slave of Huwaitib ibn Abd al-Uzza, al Yasar, a servant of Amr ibn al-Hadrami and Jabr, who was a Jew and then became a Muslim. This Quran is only a tale of the ancients, like the tales of Rustam and Isfandiyar. In any case, why would the Quran acknowledge critics who accused the book of having non-Arabic origins? And why would Hadiths tell us of various people of foreign tongue instructing Muhammad? It, if the Quran arose long after Muhammad is supposed to have lived, as appears to have been the case, then the editors of the Quran would have been working with non-Arabic material and rendering, rendering, it, it, rendering it into Arabic. In that case, they would have needed to explain the non-Arabic elements of the Quran just as they needed to explain the variants in the Quranic manuscripts and in Islamic doctrine. But those non-Arabic elements are indeed in place. There are numerous, uh, clearly non-Arabic Jewish and Christian sources and uh, for them, much of the theological milieu is known. These sources indicate not only that the Bible as a source, but other material as well. In the Quran story, for example, of the creation of Adam and Eve, we find that Allah creates Adam and then orders the angels to prostrate themselves before him. Satan refuses, saying, I'm better than he. You created me out of fire. You created him out of clay. 
And Allah thereupon curses Satan and banishes him from paradise. Now, the order to the angels and Satan's refusal is not in the Bible, but is found in Jewish apocryphal literature. There, is numerous other, numer there are numerous other examples of dependence on non-Arabic sources, on Jewish and Christian sources, but there is also evidence that the Quran itself was originally not written in Arabic at all. One element of that evidence is the Quran's manifest lack of clarity, despite its boasts to the contrary. Many words in this self-proclaimed clear Arabic book are neither clear nor Arabic. The philologist Gerd Puin explains, the Quran claims for itself that it is mubin, or clear. But if you look at it, you will notice that every fifth sentence or so simply doesn't make sense. Many Muslims and Orientalists will tell you otherwise, of course, but the fact is that a fifth of the Quranic text is just incomprehensible. This is what has caused the traditional anxiety regarding translation. If the Quran is not comprehensible, if it can't be understood even in Arabic, then it's not translatable. People fear that. And since the Quran claims repeatedly to be clear, but obviously is not, as the speakers of Arabic will tell you, there's a contradiction. Something else must be going on. Islamic apologists have been sanguine about the incomprehensible sections of the Quran, and they say Allah knows what they mean, and their very presence indicates that the book was written by someone whose understanding is beyond that of ordinary mortals. The Quran itself acknowledges that the portions of the book cannot be understood and that Muslims shouldn't waste their time trying. It says, for example, it is he who sent down upon you the book, wherein are verses clear that are the essence of the book, and others ambiguous. As for those in whose hearts is swerving, they follow the ambiguous part, desiring dissension and desiring its interpretation. And none knows its interpretation, save only Allah. And those firmly rooted in knowledge say, we believe in it, all is from our Lord, yet none remembers, but man possessed of minds. That's chapter 3, verse 7. Now, perhaps such passages were placed in the book so as to explain the anomalies created by rendering considerable material that was non-Arabic into Arabic. Theodore Noldeke, the great 19th century scholar of Islam, explains what makes so much of the Quran incomprehensible. On the whole, he says, while many parts of the Quran undoubtedly have considerable rhetorical power, even over an unbelieving reader, the book aesthetically considered is by no means a first-rate performance. Let us look at how some of the extended at some of the extended narratives. It has already been noticed how vehement and abrupt they are, where they ought to be characterized by epic repose. Indispensable links, both in expression and in the sequence of events, are often omitted, so that to understand these his histories is sometimes far easier for us than for those who learned them first, because we know most of them from better sources. Um, along with this, there is a great deal of superfluous verbiage, and nowhere do we find a steady advance in the narration. Contrast in these respects the most beautiful tale, the history of Joseph and its glaring improprieties with the story in Genesis, so admirably executed in, slight, in spite of some slight discrepancies. Similar faults are found in non-narrative passages of the Quran. The connection of ideas is extremely loose, and even the syntax betrays great awkwardness. Anna Kalutha are a frequent occurrence and cannot be explained as conscious literary devices. Many sentences begin with a when or on a day when, which seem to hover in the air so that the commentators are driven to supply a think of this or some other ellipsis. Again, there's no great literary skill evinced in the frequent and needless harping on the same words and phrases. In chapter 18, for example, till that occurs no fewer than eight times. Muhammad, in short, is not in any sense a master of style. That is, Muhammad or whatever committee may have finalized the Quran in, its, in his name. In any case, these, uh, there are many, many other aspects of this that we will discuss in a later program. We're out of time now. But these and many other things indicate that the Quran is a product of historical development, that Islam itself is a product of historical evolution, and that the canonical story of Muhammad having received it and delivered it whole to his followers is absolutely not supported by the historical evidence. This is ABN's Jihad Watch so Show. I'm Robert Spencer. Thanks for being here. And God bless.